Hi, and welcome to this webinar all about uh, property deal analysis and the right way to do it. I'm going to give you a little bit of information about uh, what I see out there, the kind of analysis and DD that I see from other people, the way that we do it, and also the way that you should be doing it uh, to analyse your deals, analyse deals that wherever they're coming from, just make sure that you get your numbers, get your analysis right to make as much money as you possibly can out of each and every property uh, project that you undertake. So let's get cracking. Like I said, how to analyze property deals. There's a photo of me uh, doing what I, I uh, enjoy doing, which is teaching people how to, um, how to well, do anything involving property really. On this, on this slide, I'm looking at purchase and costs and GDV. And that's something that we're gonna cover quite a lot. So that's quite an appropriate slide for me to be pointing out to, uh, to one, of our, one of our partners here at Sourced. So, Mentioning Sourced, let's give you a bit of a, a bit of a, a background into Sourced, first of all, a bit of credibility to show you why we're the people that are, uh, uh, are the correct people to be teaching you about um, investing in property and um, analysing those deals and getting those numbers right. Why should it be us? Well, in 2017, we uh, launched a pilot scheme, which was all about uh, starting a franchise to educate people and support them in investing in property. <coughs> in February 2018, we hit 20 franchisees, so uh, pretty, pretty quick growth when we first started. It was obviously something that really appealed to a lot of people. And in April, we hit 75,000 monthly website visitors. So we were attracting a huge amount of attention around that time. Now, in August 2018, we received FCA approval, um, and that was for our peer-to-peer -peer platform, which gives us the ability to lend money to our franchisees in order to get them uh, do their property projects. We'll go into that a little bit later, uh, um, a little bit later on as well. And in September 2018, we had a worldwide business top five podcast, and that was on the iTunes chart. October 18, uh, 2018, we had 50 franchisees. So again, that, that uh, demand, that, that, uh, the amount of people that were interested in the franchise continued to grow. And we launched Sourced Capital. So we received FCA approval, and then we actually launched Sourced Capital, that funding arm of our business, in November 2018. February 2019, um, as if we weren't doing enough already, we took on a, de a, uh, a development in Manchester of 585 flats, which is a 150 million pound development, uh, GDV development. Now, the reason that I point this out is, you see a lot of people out there who are training people how to invest in property, but you never actually hear a huge amount about the deals that they're doing themselves. I point this out because we are training people how to invest in property. We are taking people through that journey of um, starting off with small property projects and eventually getting into 500, 600 flats, however, however many it might be. 150 million uh, pound development project. We're teaching people how to do it because we've done it ourselves. And in March 2019, we've been approved for ISA and pension funding. And that means that ISA and pension money can now go into our property projects through our capital branch. Uh, these guys that put money in can make a fantastic return between 10 and 12 percent at the moment. Um, but also it means that our franchisees have the ability to get their get their deals done and they can uh, borrow from us based on 70 percent of the GDV. Again, we'll talk a little bit about that later on. This is the website. So we've got five different sections at the moment. We've got property, capital, developments, care and franchise. We haven't talked about care. I'm not going to talk about it. It's something brand new that we've launched. Um, it's, it's a really exciting opportunity for our franchisees, but we're not going to go into it any more, any more than that. Maybe we'll save that for another webinar. So why would I be the right person in that, in, in, within Source to talk to you about this stuff? Well, I'm the training and development director. So every franchisee that comes on with Source has been trained by me. Now, my background um, is not only in property. I have founded, run and grown multiple businesses through different business sectors um, and made a fantastic success, success of all of them. I sold within the last two years. I've sold two of my businesses to concentrate on property full time. And over my time, I've been involved in property projects from 55 grand up to 150 million. So, again, showing you that that path of uh, starting off with smaller deals. Make, getting your property business big, bigger, growing it the right way um, up to the, the development stage. Um, I have experience of all of that. 
And over my time, I've personally executed on um, lots of different property strategies, but I also obviously um, uh, help people choose the right strategies for them to execute. Um, and I've walked them through those strategies, uh, walked them through the important things that they need to take into consideration with those strategies and also help them through it. So my experience is from lots of different property strategies and then I have more experience of other strategies by helping out other people. And that's what I do now. I assess franchisees deals. I give them lots of uh, support, lots of feedback on those deals. Uh, pros, cons, different strategies that they haven't considered, and I help them grow their business. And then I help them go and find find funding, whether that be through us or whether that be through somebody else. I help them find funding. So we've grown dozens of property businesses in the last 18 months. Here's just a few. We've got sourced all over the country um, and we are continuing to grow. So where do deals come from that I see? Well, three main sources. We've got franchisees, we've got lists, and we've got sources. I'd say that on an average month, I see probably 100 deals from franchisees, about 100 deals from property lists. You know, these lists that everybody's on the mailing list, right? You see, um, you see them every other day or so, different properties on different mailing lists. Um, and uh, the, the, the layout is usually fairly generic, and it's just over to you. You know, this is a property, here it is, over to you. No personal contact, just a list. And then property sources, which I probably see about 50, uh, 50 projects from different property sources. So I probably analyze something like 250 deals a month or around 3,000 deals a year. So again, I've done a lot of looking at deals. I've done a lot of going through due, due diligence. I've got my own process. And that process has come from, from going through uh, the due diligence time and time and time and time and time again. So you're going to benefit from, the, the, from my experience of, of looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of deals. What's important? How can you make your decision as quickly as possible? And how can you get to that point where um, you know whether you're going to proceed or not? So from sourced offices, I'd say it probably takes me about 15 minutes to assess a deal. Um, most of the information is already provided. Uh, if more information is needed, it's very, very quick to be delivered because the, the, the office might not have put the information through, but they might have been aware of it. If I have any questions, they have the knowledge and it's very easy to get, to get uh, the answers to those questions. And one of the main things, one of my bugbears, and if you look at my Facebook and you follow me, uh, follow some of the stuff that I do on social media, I've got a bit of a bugbear around yields, return on investment and return on capital employed because I don't think everybody that, that calculates these numbers really understands what the differences are and how you calculate them properly. Obviously the sourced offices do and that's why I've put it in here because I know that I'm getting accurate numbers from the offices. Lists, so they, these email lists that come out, I mean generally they've got a high level of information that's fairly good. Um, getting more information is always tough um, because you're on a list, right? And this list might have gone out to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And so you might be just one in a queue of hundreds of people that are asking questions about that deal, especially if it's a good deal. And it can take a long time for that request to be actioned. Now, if the first person that makes, a, um, uh, makes an inquiry is, um, is then the buyer, what happens to all those hundreds of people behind that buyer that have also made an inquiry? Obviously, they're going to be um, they, they're going to be disappointed because they don't get that property. So, like I said, you end up being one in the queue of many, many people. Now, from other sources, this is genuinely an email that I got from another source containing only that that information. So, it was a right move link, and it was that sentence underneath looks like a good deal! Exclamation mark. Now, I I didn't even click on the right move link. I sent an email back to the sourcer and I said, I said to them, either we need to we need to work on the way that you present your deals, or there's no point in sending me anything. I'll be honest with you, I haven't clicked on that right move link. I am not interested in doing everything myself. You are the sourcer. You should show me your workings out to justify why you're going to send me that deal. Now, if you want to work with me, let's go ahead. If you don't want to work with me, you know, I'm I'm happy to miss out on these right move links. That's okay with me. And we'll talk a little bit about, about that in the, in, the next, in the coming slides about the, the, the standard that you set and what you will accept. Getting further info usually takes forever. And the, re the reason for that is that there are usually chains of sources. So this sourcer, you know, they're clearly not great because all they've sent me is a right move link. 
of this sourcer might have got this deal from another sourcer who might have got it from another sourcer. And they might send you the right move link, but they might say, oh yeah, but I'm direct to vendor on, to vendor on this. You don't need to go through the agent. But actually that's through sources and sources and sources. And so getting information has to go through 10 people, a chain of 10 people rather than just one person. So sources get a fairly bad reputation and you know, from some of them, to be fair, rightly so, because they're not doing a great job. Now, like I just gave you the example of, I don't allow um, that kind of sourcer to work with me or to have regular contact with me. I don't think that's fair. Now, what, what I do do, and I'm working with a couple of sources at the moment where I'll say, you can send me deals, but they need to come through in this kind of format. And I'll show them the way that I want to receive deals. I'll show them the working out that they need to do. I'll show them the, the figures and the justification and the numbers that they need to send me. And if they're not prepared to do that, that's absolutely fine. It, but I won't work with them anymore because I look at so many deals that it needs to come through in a format that suits my due diligence because that's where the standard is. My due diligence is, is, is setting the standard for everyone around it and it will save me hours and hours and hours in the long run. So due diligence takes time. And if somebody continually presents deals to you, um, in a format that is compatible, then that's fantastic. If they do it in a format that isn't compatible, it's going to take you time. So why would you tolerate that? Set your standard high and stick to it. And over and above all, you've got your due diligence process there because it makes sense and because um, it's, it's mitigating the risk in that property deal that you need to be mitigated. So don't alter your due diligence process. Ask the person that's presenting the deal to you to, to alter the way that they present those deals. This is one of the ways that I, I show uh, source franchisees how to present deals. Now, this is a blank piece of paper. This is what, like an, uh, what an email should look like if it's going to be sent out by one of the franchisees to somebody that they're, they're sourcing for or, that, or they're trying to sell a property project for. <laughs> now, this is the aesthetic of how it should look. But essentially, you know, all the important information is there. You've got an image, you've got the title, you've got a brief description. You've got the very specific numbers, then you've got background about the credibility and you've got comparables at the bottom. Now, essentially, your due diligence needs to do the same for you. Um, but this is just how people that, that I train would send information out into the world to, to try and sell a deal. <clears throat> now, essentially, I have four stages of due diligence. I've got um, stage number one, which is the overview. Stage number two, which is for red flags. Stage number three, which is the uh, which are the numbers, and stage number four, which is the um, uh, the certainty at the end. Now, stage number one, what are we looking for from stage number one? Really, we just want a very very brief overview, because you don't want to put too much time into this property project at the moment because you don't know whether it works or not. But you want a brief overview, which is fairly generic which will tell you whether it's worth pursuing that project or not. Because if it is worth pursuing that project, you wanna take it down, you wanna spend more time on it, you wanna go deeper into the numbers. If it's not, you wanna move, move it to one side and go and spend your time doing something, uh, looking at a different project that will uh, make, the, make you the margin that you're looking for. So first of all, what do I look at first? I'm gonna look at the strategy first. I'm gonna look at what kind of property strategy this is, because the first thing that I'm concerned about isn't whether, the, whether the, the opportunity works or not, it's whether it suits me. Will this uh, property project help me reach my goals? Do I have the necessary skill to analyse this deal and can I make this deal happen? So what that means is, does it tie in with the goals that, I'm, that I've set for myself? Have I got the experience or can I, can I use other people's experience in order to make this happen? And will it go through? Because if you don't have, you know, if, you're, if, if all you've done is um, rent to rent or all you've done is very small flips and you're looking at a, a project like the one that we're building in Manchester of 585 flats, you probably don't have the necessary backing to, to get that property project through, but you also probably don't have the necessary skill in order to analyze that deal properly because it's a completely different animal to the projects that you've been doing. So I, I would, uh, I would encourage everybody to have a goal, at least a 12 month goal of where they want to be in 12 months time. And is this project that you're about to analyze, is it going to fit in with the, those goals? If yes, carry on to the numbers. If no, then you need to walk away from it. 
So let's look at the numbers next. Now this is going to be just set high level numbers at this stage, because again, like I said, we don't want to spend too much time on it. Purchase and costs. So all I want to know is the, the, the purchase price of the property and the very general, uh, general, generic costs. So stamp duty and some solicitors costs in there. The build cost, we're going to have to estimate at this point because I don't think it's fair to involve a builder at every single stage for every single project that you're looking at when you're doing the overview. And the GDV we're going to get from comparables. So the GDV, what's the end property going to be? If it's going to be a refurb property, what's the value of a refurb property on that street? If it's going to be split into flats, what are the value of the flats? If it's going to be turned into a HMO, what's the value of a HMO? So it's what is that end value going to be and you do that from comparables and then finally you can work out what your margin is going to be now the margin is a subjective thing it completely sits on what you are looking for out of a property project so a lot of investors are looking for something like a 20 percent margin and that's a very healthy margin right if, they, if you're making 20 percent on your money you're doing very well in comparison to most other investments out there now for me because i know uh, I want to cherry pick the absolute best deals. And for me, the absolute best deals are going to be 50% return on my money or more. So I'm going even higher, right? I'm really squeezing that orange to get as much juice out of it as I can. Now, 50% might seem like quite a lot. What we're going to do later in this webinar is we're going to go through, um, we're going to go through Rightmove and we're going to have a look for properties and we're going to see if we can find something that has got 50% in it. So maybe I'll surprise you that I can find something. So here we go. We've got two examples of numbers at this very early stage of stage one, which is the overview. So we've got purchase and costs of 190 plus 10, a build of 40 and a GDV of 300, which gives me a margin of 60,000 pounds, which is a 25% return. So so that seems pretty good. It's certainly over the 20% that an investor would be interested in. Uh, it's under my 50%, but there's something in there for somebody. Example number two, slightly different, 190 plus 10, build cost of 80, GDV of 290 and a margin of 10. So that's a 3.5% return. And I think for me, for you, for almost everybody out there, that's going to be a no. Now, what we do at, what we do at Sourced is that project, number, example number one, now that wouldn't be right for me, but I know it would be right for somebody out there. So instead of me taking that project on, if I were looking to source properties onto investors, then I could still pursue that and go down the due diligence, really tighten up my numbers as I'm going to show you how to, and then move that onto an investor. And this is all about, this comes back to all of the goals, right? Because if I am property sourcing and selling to investors, that would be perfect. If I'm not, if I'm just looking to add to my portfolio, then my, my standard is set at 50 and I wouldn't pursue that project. So again, there's, there's something in that. It's still gonna make a very good return. It just depends on what your goals are and what you're trying to achieve in the next 12 months as to whether you take that on. So if you're sourcing it to pass, and then example number two would be a fail. Now, I think you'll agree that we haven't gone into the numbers in any great detail there. Now, for 90% of people that are out there, 90% of sources that I see when I first, when they first make contact with me, um, that's the level of due diligence that I get. Now, that, as I explained to them, is a huge waste of time. It's a waste of their time and it's a waste of my time. And in, in most cases, those, deal, those deals don't get pursued. They don't happen. In the worst cases, money can get wasted if you're going to... Um, uh spend any money on surveys or or you know taking the due diligence down uh doing it in a not very intelligent way and that will eventually annoy investors and it will annoy estate estate agents if you're making offers all over the place or if you're if you're um if your offer's accepted and then you just can't make it happen because because you haven't done your due diligence correctly and and, and information that really should have come out at the very beginning comes out a couple of weeks down the line and it may, it means that the project can't go ahead so let's say that we've got a project, we've gone through those numbers, liking in example number one, and it looks like a good deal. What happens next? So the next stage is stage two, and this is all about the red flags. So firstly, what you're gonna look at at stage two is did the strategy throw up any red, red flags? And the red flags I mean, you know, these are the big game changing issues that can be involved in property, are gonna be stuff like, is there a planning requirement 
um, for you to do that project? Or is there a planning application in place that you're, you're going to take advantage of? What's the local legislation like for affecting that use class of property? Is there a change of use involved? And is it a cash purchase or only? All of these things can, on their own, wipe out a project from working. It can um, take away all of the profit and it can even cost you money if you don't do your due diligence correctly with these things that cause the red flags. So let's take planning as the example. Now, if you have planning in place, if you've got um, a three bedroom house <coughs> that's got a large garden and the plan, it has a plan to um, uh, build another three bedroom house in the garden. Planning has been approved and you're thinking, oh, fantastic. I can pretty quickly work out what the cost of uh, planning, uh, uh, what the cost of the build is going to be. And then I'm going to make that margin. Now, planning can throw up lots of different issues. It can, um, first of all, the council have different ways of charging through planning. And also uh, they can up put certain stipulations on planning, all of which have a huge impact on your margin. So what I would suggest is if you have any of these red flags that come up, you need to have a look through that document. You need to read every single planning document that you can in relation to that property. Sounds really boring, doesn't it? And you know what? In some in some cases it can be. It can also be very enlightening. However, it is very, very necessary because if you don't read something in planning that's going to cost you hundreds of thousands of pounds and you take off on a project and you make a commitment, then you're going to have to fit that bill or you're going to have to forego that project. And so it's something that you definitely need to do at this early stage to make sure you understand exactly what is going on. Oops. So uh, local legislation affecting the use class proposed. So that's, as most people will know, that's going to be something like HMOs, right? So HMOs, you've got Article 4 and Article 4 can, uh, can um, stop you building HMOs in certain areas. Change of use, that can be for other changes of use as well, not just normal C3 to C4, um, normal residential to HMO. And cash purchase only, why is that on here? Well, cash purchases can, um, can affect your GDV because you're reducing the market that you can go to. Basically, a cash purchase is not mortgageable, so you need to find out why. So let's go through these in a little bit more detail. So what was I talking about in planning that can cost you so much money? So you might have heard of SIL, the Community Infrastructure Levy, levy or you might have heard of S106. Both are charges that the council can put onto any planning application, usually the bigger ones, uh, to be honest, but they can put that on any planning application in order to, to um, charge you for building what you're going to build because they, they feel like the community needs it in order to maintain a supply of service. So you need to keep an eye out for those kind of things. And you know, it's not gonna be in big, bold letters on the, front of the, um, on the front of the document. It's going to be buried in the document. So you need to make sure that you read that document from beginning to end. The council can also make a specific stipulations um, for things that you need to do in order to, to get that project, uh, get that project underway. So you need to look out for these stipulations. You might have to, uh, they can ask for absolutely anything. So you need to, you need to make sure that you've read through the stipulations, you've read through any additional charges that they're putting on, on, the, on the, pro, uh, the project, because that is going to affect your bottom line. And then finally, you need to take particular uh, note of the dates, because as you know, uh, in general, you'll have three years to, to enact planning, uh, a planning uh, uh, approval. And so you need to make sure that you, you are aware of the dates. And if you are going to use that planning application, that it's still within date. Now, if it's out of date, does that mean that you can very easily get that planning application reapproved? Well, unfortunately not. You have to go through a brand new planning application to get that approved. So um, if somebody ever says to you, yeah, planning has lapsed. However, it's going to be really easy to get planning again because you're just going for the same thing. That is not necessarily true because the council might have changed what they're doing, uh, changed their focus, changed what they're trying to achieve from that community, from that neighbourhood. So uh, if planning has lapsed, it's as good as not having planning at all. So legislation, what did I mean by uh, legislation issues that might arise? So this will depend uh, on your strategy, for example, Article 4, like I said. Uh, but it could also be from a B1A office to a C3 residential. That's a commercial conversion. That's why commercial conversions have been so popular since 2015. 
Now, <clears throat> let's just quickly, another little bugbear of mine is Article 4, because everybody think, well, most people think that Article 4 refers only to HMO, and that isn't true. Article 4 is the removal of a permitted development right. So under permitted development, you have the right to change a C3 residential property to a C4 HMO, or you have the right to change a B1A office to a C3 residential, right? That's a permitted development. They're both permitted developments. Now, in that area, the, uh, the, the council can remove that permitted development and they can say, actually, if you're going to change a C3 residential to a C4 HMO, we want you to go through planning because we want to be able to approve it. And they do that by having Article 4 and uh, enabling Article 4 in that area, which means that you can't do that change from C3 to C4. And it's exactly the same with commercial conversions. They might say, well, actually, we don't want any more converted commercial buildings in this area. So we're going to enact Article 4 in that area to remove the permitted development right of B1A to C3. So if you've got Article 4 in your area, the first thing that you should do is check what that refers to, because it might not be about the HMO. I hope that makes sense. Next, we've got licensing and selective licensing. So uh, that's just an additional charge that you need to be aware of. And is the change of use allowed? So you've got a change of use. Is that allowed or do you need to go through planning for that? So it's just making the correct, uh, the correct checks with the local council, depending on your strategy. Cash only purchase. So this could affect the GDV because it reduces the amount of people that can buy the property. Cash only purchase means it's unmortgageable. And why wouldn't a mortgage company uh, mortgage a property? It could have subsidence. It could... Um, it might not have running water, might not have a bathroom, might not have a kitchen. Now, all of these are fairly simple to solve, but the, the, the numbers go on and on and on. I'm sorry, the, the, the reasons that the um, uh, mortgage company wouldn't mortgage a property go on and on and on. Um, so from your point of view, what you need to do is identify what the problem is. Because when you're selling that project, you're going to want it to be open to as much of the audience as possible so you can achieve the highest value. So identify what the project is, find out how much it'll cost to do, uh, and work that into your numbers that we're going to do next. So numbers. Purchase of the property. What you want to do now is just break down every single cost that you can for every stage of your property project. So the purchase isn't just the cost of the property and the, the, the stamp duty like we've looked at before, but it's the cost of the property, the stamp duty, solicitors fees, planning, legislation, building work, adi uh, any additional costs, and the mortgage application fee, if you're going to, or bridging application fee, whatever it is, the, the money lending application. Then for ongoing rental, you do the same thing. You'd look at rental income, and then you take off the costs, which would be insurance, 10% for voids, 10% for maintenance. In a HMO, you'll have all the utilities, so you'll need to break that all down. And then you need to take off your mortgage payment as well. Because when you're, when you're looking at um, uh, property projects, you wanna be working on net. You really don't wanna be using gross figures for your uh, for this stage of due diligence now that we're at stage number three <clears throat> so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take you through some of the due diligence so if you're holding or selling first of all let's just go back one so yield return on investment and return on capital employed that's the important stuff if you're holding you obviously want to use the rental income if you're selling you want to use the profit generated from the sale, right? Because that's your, that's your profit margin. The net uh, rental income we're going to use or the net uh, profit generated from selling the property. Now, would you ever calculate both? Yeah, of course you would. Now, on some of the projects that I've done, some of the properties that I've looked at, I've calculated six or seven different exits to make sure that I am going to pursue the exit that produces the most money and from initially looking at a project you might think that that's you know strategy a is going to definitely be the best strategy to, to to use on that project whereas you know it might actually be strategy c that that not only fits in with the goals that you're trying to achieve but also it um it produces the best return from that property so what do we now need we're going to use these numbers. Now, they're in the same format as before, purchase cost, GDV. Because we're at stage number three and because we're going through numbers, we're going to, we're going to assume that all of these are the net numbers and they're all 
verified and accurate. So the rental, uh, GDV, cost and purchase, all of these numbers have been verified. We've got as many numbers in there. We've got as much detail as we can in those numbers. Because what we're going to do is we're going to work out exactly what the return is that we're going to generate on that property. Now, the first thing that we're going to do is ROI. Most people throw this around in property, the ROI, return on investment. Now, ROI and ROCE, uh, return on capital employed, there is a difference in the way that you calculate these numbers. First of all, the return on investment, ROI. Return on investment is the return on the total investment. So the ROI should include all of the money that you're borrowing as well as, as, well as all of the money that you're putting in. So for buy to let, we're going to use £1,200 rental income. Uh, the net of that is 11420 The buy to sell return from the uh, profit generated is £85,000. So I'm just going to hop back one screen. So that's using those numbers at the bottom there. So the buy to sell is uh, £85,000 profit and the net rental income is 11420 and next we need to calculate that return on investment. So the first thing that we need is, is the return. So just down here, we've got the 11,420, that's the return, if we're going to rent it out. The investment total is 270,000 pounds. That's all the purchase and all the, all the costs and all of the build. So you divide 11,420 by 270, multiply it by 100, and that gives you a return on investment of 4.2%. If we're working on out the buy to sell return, that's 85,000 because that's our profit. Again, divided by the total investment, which is 270,000 times 100, and that's 31.4% return on total investment. Now, for me, I don't really use return on investment because I don't see why it's more, more useful to, to get a return on the total investment. It doesn't work for me. So I don't use that one very much, but if you want to use it, if it's easy for you to use those numbers, then so long as you keep on using that structure of, of working it out, then that can be absolutely perfect for you. For me, what I use is return on capital employed. Now, the reason that I use return on capital employed is that the numbers that you generate from working it out this way are not only really good for uh, comparing properties to each other, but they're really good for uh, comparing your cash on cash investment. So I know that my return, my money is going to uh, achieve a certain return and I can compare that to another investment let's say I've invested in wind farms and I know that those wind farms are producing a 10% return for me but if I put more of my money into property that I'd re uh, produce a bigger return because I can compare those two investments I know which one's performing the best so I always always use return on capital employed so how do we do this First out, you've got to, first of all, you've got to work out what you're spending because return on capital employed isn't interested in the money that you're borrowing to do this deal. It's interested in the money that you're putting into it. So the purchase price for this property was £220,000, which means that we're going to have to leave a £55,000 deposit. Now, the costs were £50,000, if you remember, for their build. And so the total money that we've put into it is £105,000. 25% deposit plus costs, and then the costs of the build, which is 50. So £105,000. That's the capital employed. The return is the same as we use for return on investment. That doesn't change because that part of the project is the same. So the rental income, 11420 which is net, divided by £105,000 times 100. So the rental income, the actual cash return that we're making is 10.8%. Now that's far, that's a far more accurate number. It's a far more interesting number to me than the return on investment number. The profit to the, from the sale is 85,000 pounds. Divide that by 105 and multiply by 100 means that the return on investment from selling the property is 80%. Now that's pretty decent. You know, if you imagine where else you're going to get an 80% return on your money from, and in this kind of project, looking at these numbers, this project's going to take between six and nine months. It's a, it's a, it's a fictitious project. However, looking at a, you know, £220,000 purchase price uh, and build of 50, um, six to nine months maximum. So within 12 months, you can make 80% return on your money, which is a pretty decent deal to me. So like I said, it's great for comparing investments like stocks and shares, interest that you're getting, ISIS, pensions, whatever. Wherever your money is, you can use return on capital employed 
in order to generate that number. So I would encourage everybody to use return on capital employed. I think it's a much better metric. It's a much more useful metric. Yield is a bit more old school. It's something that a lot of people used to use um, when I first got into property. You, you certainly used to see it a lot until return on capital employed came, um, uh, became a lot more useful. And the yield is just working out the, the rental income as opposed to the value of the property. So uh, the yield on here, I've used the gross figures because I'm trying to keep you on your toes. Um, because people will do this. Some people will use gross yield, some people will use net, net yield. But what they'll say is the yield is 4%. Now it's very important for you, if somebody presents a deal to you or you're looking at a deal for you to, to then say, how did you calculate your figures or have you got net? Some people might say that they've got net when they haven't. So for you to understand how to calculate this, when it's gross or net is very important. So you can check other people's due diligence as well as coming up with the correct numbers yourself. So yield, for this one, we've used the gross rental income, which is 14,400, and divided that by 355,000 pounds, which is the, uh, the GDV, the end value of the property, multiplied by 100, and we've got a 4% net yield, uh, sorry, gross yield. So yield is good for comparing um, uh, rental income from one property to the other, but it's really not that good at comparing investments or you know, going to that next level like return on capital employed can. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a quick look at short term finance, because when you're analysing these property deals, um, you can layer your finance. And if you're layering finance, you need to know how to work that out. So short term finance, you've got bridging peer to peer or you've got a JV uh, and long term finance, you've got residential mortgage or a commercial mortgage. Now, these have all got different criteria. As you can see, I've written down here. Bridging is 70 percent value, 70 um, percent of the value. Peer to peer, 70 percent of the GDV. Residential mortgage is 75% of the purchase price. Commercial mortgage is, is, is the multiple of the gross annual rent. So all of these different avenues lend in different ways, which frees up different options for you to knit them together to make the most out of that property project. Now, what I would suggest, and I suggest this to everybody, when I train people, I train them on finance and contracts because that's the right thing to train people on in order to allow them to do any property project that is presented to them. Understanding your financial options is a massive benefit to you. And I would suggest that everybody does it in order to best understand how you can make the most out of that property project. So what we're going to do with this example is we'll use short term finance for the original purchase and the build. And then we're going to refinance it onto the higher valuation and rent it out. And this should release some of the money. We should get some of the money back that we originally put into that deal on the refinance, which means that we'll have a better return for our cash that's actually left in the deal. Uh, whether we're keeping or trading, we need to show that all of this fits together. So let's have a look. This is financial stage one. £220,000 purchase plus £50,000 costs equals uh, £270,000. So we're using the same numbers, right? So we're not changing anything. GDV is still 355,000. Now peer to peer will lend us 70% of the GDV, which is 248,500. So in order to do that deal, we need 270. We can borrow 248,500. So we need to put in 21,500 ourselves. So that's the first stage. That's the first lender that you're borrowing from. You're, you've got that money. You've put 21,500 in yourself and you've done that property. You've refurbed it exactly as per, per the plan of 50,000 pounds. And now we're looking at the refinance. Now I used to look at this in a way that it was overly complicated for myself. So I used to look at this in a way that um, I looked at the deposits that I needed to put in. And if you're doing the same, I think that you are, um, you're making it too, you're making it more difficult than you need to. Because if you focus on where your money has been borrowed from, where the charges on the property are and how you pay them back first, it's much easier to work it out that way to, to knit all of this finance together. So the second stage, we're going to use a mortgage because we're looking for that long term lend. Right. So the second stage is going to be 75 percent of the loan to value. Now, that's going to be two hundred and sixty six thousand uh, two hundred and fifty pounds based on that GDV of three hundred and fifty five thousand pounds. So that's 75 percent of the three five five. So the first thing that we'll do is pay off the first charge. The first charge was two four eight, if you remember rightly. 
which means that we've spent 248,000 of that 266, and we've got 17,750 left. That 17,750 can go back into our pocket to pay ourselves back for that original 21,000 that we put into this deal, which means that we've got, we've only got 3,750 of our own money left in that deal. Now, if we re recalculate the return on capital employed based on the money that we've still got left in that deal, it's going to come back a lot better. So the net rental income was 11,420. Divide that by 3,750. And that means the return on capital employed for that project, once we've knitted these financial options together, is now 305%. So we were pretty impressed with 80% earlier, right? But now we're on 305%. What, what other investments do you know of out there that can get you 305% within a, within, a within a period of 12 months? <clears throat> pretty impressive. So that's how you would knit all of those numbers together. And that's the level of uh, information and detail that you need to go into when you're putting those financial, those financial stories together. You need to know exactly how it's gonna work when it's going to work uh, and you need to include all costs um, that you've incurred in borrowing from all of these different places so we've done stage three that's the numbers now 305 percent return i'm going to i'm going to say that that's a pass and now what i'm looking for is the certainty so i'm going to move that property now onto stage four so where do you get certainty from well it depends what your exit is if you're looking to sell you're going to want to find out what the st sales statistics are like in that area, how quickly properties are selling and how quickly properties like yours are selling. If you're going to be uh, producing a HMO, you're going to need to know how quickly uh, the, the rooms are renting. So you're probably going to look on a website like Spare Room, find out how, how the tenant uh, profile is looking, find out how many tenants are looking at, the t at that time in comparison to how many rooms there are available. And if you're looking at rental statistics on a single let basis, you're probably going to want to speak to your estate agent and find out exactly what the market is like uh, at the moment. So a recap on the four stages. We've got stage one of the overview, stage two red flags, stage three numbers, and stage four is certainty. Now let's have a look at putting that into a property. <clears throat> so I found this property and I'm going to hop out of this right now. Uh, let's go to here. Yeah. So I'm going to hop into Chrome and I found this property in Manchester earlier today. This is on right move right now, so you can go and find it. Um, now I've been looking in Manchester for title splits. So I was interested in this property of having a look at the floor plan because this property is over four floors. Um, this is the smallest floor. These look a decent size. Now, what I need to do, first of all, is I, want, I need to make sure that that floor is over 30 square metres because 30 square metres is the cutoff for having a unit on its own uh, and mortgageable. So I want to do a title split. I want to, all of these to be on separate titles that I can sell individually. Um, and I did do that and it comes out over 30 square metres. So this, is a, <clears throat> this, is, this, seems to, this looks like it works for me. So the next thing that I'm going to do is <clears throat> I've got two screens that are exactly the same here, two tabs, because I don't want to lose that property while I'm while I'm having a look at the comparables. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to these comparables. Now, bear in mind that on that first page, uh, this one I'll scroll down and show you. Those comparables there, it will only show you comparables on the same street at that stage. But when you come through to this stage, when you click view more just underneath, it'll start to show you stuff from, you've got a lot, a lot more control over exactly where you see the comparables for here at the top. Now, first thing I notice is this top one, which sold, it's a four bedroom, ours is a five. It sold in 2016, but it sold for 820, which is a lot more than I was considering. So let's have a look at what that was and, and what the layout of that is. So one, two, three, four, again, four floors, Let's have a look at the images, see the state of the interior. OK, so obviously somebody's just refurbed that and they're looking to um, they must have refurbed it and then they're looking to sell on. So let's just double check that against the state of my interior. It's been lived in. It's a tiny bit tired, uh, but it's pretty decent. So 
we've immediately got an, uh, an opportunity to sell a very, very similar property for £820,000. That's interesting. Um, now, I had a look at Rightmove earlier on today for the flats in that area. And flats tend to go for about 175, which would mean 175,000, which would mean that the, the GDV, if I split it into flats, would be something like 700,000. It obviously involves quite a lot of work as well. However, look, if I, if I don't, if I do less work um, and I've got less of a headache because I don't have to go through all the bureaucracy of get, doing a title split, then I can still, I can make an additional 120,000 pounds. So from my point of view, I think that makes sense. And that's the option that I'm going to go with. That I'm going to, um, I'm going to look at doing it as a refurb project instead of doing it as a title split. So what else can I do to see that the comparables are going to be up in that kind of neck of the woods? Now it's from 2016, which isn't ideal, but what I will do at this point is I'll go within a quarter of a mile. Uh, I'll choose semi-detached because that my house was a semi-detached house and I'll go within the last year. So we've got four bedrooms well it is four bedrooms but it's not the same style of house so there's going to be a difference in value that's a flat so that's um what is it a flat it looks like a flat so that isn't going to be a good comparable that's a three bedroom it went for 520 which is still significant but again that's not the best comparable that's a much better comparable even though it's from a little bit further further ago um, it's a much better comparable because it's a it's a similar unit similar unit within a quarter of a mile sold within a year seven hundred and fifty thousand pounds so again we're up in that neck of the woods seven hundred and seven hundred and fifty to eight hundred and twenty thousand pounds so I'm, I'm i'm happy with that gdv um uh, being up at around the eight hundred thousand pound mark so let's just hop back into the webinar okay so the strategy that we're going to do is a refurb have i got the experience have i got the ability have i got the skill to analyze that deal of yes i have i've done projects like that before in the past um and so first stage of the overview of due diligence has passed second second part of the uh, stage number one which is the purchase the build and the gdv well i talked to the estate agent earlier today and i said uh, that i was interested in that property and i could move quickly would they take 580 and the estate agent said yes even though it says on there that it offers over 600 they said that they would accept 580. so very brief numbers right now 580 purchase thirty-eight thousand pounds stamp duty build i think because it's just a refurb we're not changing use we're not we're not doing too much to it build is going to be around 50 and the gdv i'm going to use the 820 which means that my margin if i sell that project on is £150,000, £152,000 to be accurate, or 65%. So we've actually found something on the market with a huge margin. So in this property we have, so moving on to stage two and red flags, we don't have any planning to consider. We don't have a change of use to consider. There's no local legislation for the, for the use class of C3, especially when you're refurbing, and it's not a cash purchase only. So stage two is easily scooted through. There's nothing that we need to consider. Stage three numbers. So option one, I'm going to run a couple of options and see which one's the best one to hold on to or the best one to execute. So option number one is a flip. So the deposit is £145,000. So we're going to be borrowing £435,000 and that's going to be held as the first charge from the lender. Stamp duty is 38, solicitor is 1,500, mortgage application is 1,500, and the mortgage interest over eight months is going to cost us £20,000. That's all of our costs involved. Uh, the end costs are going to be an agent fee and a solicitor's fee, which is going to be for selling, it's going to be about £2,500. Now, if you remember purchase costs and GDV, the build costs, we, we then went out and got three separate build costs from three separate builders who have done that kind of work before and the builder that I had the best uh, rapport with the best uh, the best experience of using them and they've got the best um, uh, finish from the projects that we've seen before was builder number two so we're not going with the cheapest we're not going to automatically uh, think that the most expensive is the best we've checked them out we've done our due diligence on the builder and we're going to go with option number two we're going to sit in the in the middle 
GDV, I'm happy with the comparables of 820 and 750. And I'm going to go with 820 because I think the, the standard of finish on our project is going to be very similar to the one that is uh, that sold for, uh, previously for 820. So the return on capital employed on a refurb and a flip, the return is £126,500 and the capital employed would be £208,500. So that's a 61% return on capital employed. So again, we've taken those original numbers, we've really drilled them down to get the very specific numbers for every single stage of that project. We know exactly to the pound how much uh, money we're going to need to put in and we're, we're going to know so long as the project goes as expected that it's going to return us 126,500 pounds so that's if it was just option number one and we just did it as a very straightforward purchase on a mortgage and then and then uh, or, or on a bridge without the refinance and then and then uh, um, flip it so option number two we're looking we're, we're going to look at holding the property instead so instead of selling it on we're going to look at holding the property now if you remember from the previous example we do this as a refinance so we'll buy the property on a bridge we'll do all the building work under the bridge and then we'll refinance the property hopefully pull as much of our money out as possible and then rent it out and when we rent it out we'll have less of our money tied up into the property and so our return on that money will be even better so let's have a look at how that fits together so the costs are going to be the same but we need the net, uh, we need the rental price which we found off right move and that's two thousand five hundred pounds uh, per month or thirty thousand pounds a year now when you take all of the costs of running that property and the mortgage and so on and so forth into consideration that nets us four thousand eight hundred pounds per year so let's start at the beginning the bridge would lend us seventy percent or four hundred and six thousand of that five hundred and eighty that we need to buy the property so the cash in we would need to put 237,500 pounds cash into that property plus the 50 grand bill so we need to put in 287,500 pounds into that property and once work is completed you then need to refinance onto a long-term loan property values higher at 820,000 which means that the mortgage lends 75 percent of that which is 615,000 we pay off the first charge, which is 406,000, which means that we have 209,000 pounds left to play with. And we'll repay ourselves, if you remember from the top there, we, we had to put 287,500 in. We've repaid 209, which means that we've got 78,500 pounds tied up into that property. The return on capital employed and a, and a refinance on rent, the return is uh, 4,800, and the capital employed is 78,500 which means that the return on capital employed to hold it and rent it is 6.1%. Again, not really that exciting for me. Which option are you going to choose? You're going to choose, are you going to choose uh, flipping it and getting rid of it and making that big six figure sum? Or are you going to hold on to it and make 6.1%? For me, I'm going to make option one. I'm going to choose option one all day long. If I could have a few of those projects and a few of those projects overlapping, then I'm a very happy boy. So moving on to stage four, which is certainty, having talked to three estate agents about, about renting, uh, renting properties out, um, it's a high demand for single lets in Didsbury with something like 4% voids. But really, we're not gonna go down that route, we're gonna go down the flipping the property on. So we've had a look at the sales stats and the sales stats are very strong for Didsbury. Didsbury is a beautiful area of Manchester. Um, it's very, very high demand, uh, which we've had confirmed by estate agents. So it makes sense to go for option one. So what's our process? Um, obviously, it's it's going to be fairly easy to, to have one of these projects on the go at any one time because you, uh, you you're not swarmed with numbers. For us, though, you know, with me analysing a couple of hundred deals every single uh, uh, every single week, or sorry, every single month, then we need a process. We need a system. And as you scale your business, you're going to have to do exactly the same thing. You need to have a CRM system. What's going on here? Let me just escape from that. Um, you're going to need a CRM system to keep an eye on all of these things. So let me show you what we use as our CRM system. So we've designed this CRM system ourselves. We've got a lot of information in there. Um, let's take you to the properties page. This is going to throw me out now. So let me just log in.
can't talk and type at the same time. Um, typical not multitasking. So this is the CRM system. Properties, we have, uh, if we add a property in here, it's got all of the boxes uh, already identified so that the franchisees know exactly what they're expected to do. And once, once they've saved the property, they get uh, options of adding attachments, um, doing marketing uh, blurb and all that kind of stuff. So this is the, the, the central hub. If, they've got a, if they're going to do a project that's got, that requires planning, then they can put all of the documents in here. They know it's all in one place. And between me and between them, we can throw the property backwards and forwards to each other, exchanging notes and exchanging ideas or tips. Um, so we've got a lot of stuff going on within this CRM system that we've built. So that's how we do that. And let me show you then our deal calculator. So there's lots of deal calculators out there. You know, I've, cr I create deal calculators all the time because it's, it's, I find it much easier to use a very specific deal calculator that answers the question that I'm asking rather than to have one big deal calculator. And this is the big deal calculator. Fortunately for us, it's an absolute belter. It not only answers all of the big questions, but it goes into that specific detail. So the first thing you do is put your property details in there and you can ask buy to let questions, buy to sell questions, HMO, rent to rent, service accommodation, title split. You can look at commercial conversions and then going even further, you can even, even calculate new build developments. And that part of the deal calculator is an absolute monster, but the details that you get from it are superb. So that's what we, that's what we use. And, I would encourage you to have something very similar. If you're going to use the CRM system, make sure that, that CRM system suits exactly what you're trying to do. Now, how do the franchisees use this around sourced? So the franchisee would source a property opportunity, they'd crunch the numbers, they'd go through their due diligence, they'd put it over from HQ to review. Uh, so I get a notification in that CRM system and I look through it. And at that point we decide you've got two options once it's been verified by me and they can sell the opportunity for a fee or they can buy it themselves from using the peer-to-peer -peer platform. If they're going to sell it, it's passed on to the marketing team to take care of that. If they're going to uh, give it to the peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer platform in order to raise money, then they'll, the opportunity is passed for the funding team and that is all done in-house between us and the franchisee. And then we can get that property project on the go and making the franchisee money as soon as possible. So we have lots of different franchisees. We've got over 50 offices uh, um, across the UK. Obviously, we've got the exclusive lending through the peer-to-peer -peer platform. Only franchisees can, can borrow from there. And we put on events. So uh, tonight, we've got our networking event in London. There's going to be over 100 people in that room. Uh, it's it's a, in Islington. So if you're around in London and you can get there, uh, it's a great place to go. Our MD, Steve, is going to be there this evening. And the benefits of being part of Sourced, obviously we've got the national brand, uh, we receive, you receive an exclusive territory and you get a five day comprehensive training course with ongoing training every quarter. Um, and obviously the ongoing support from us, the strategy support, the suggestions, the tips, the guidance on every single deal that you find. And what do we send you? Well, we send you property leads, we send you investor leads, we manage your email campaigns out to investors. We've got national brand marketing to increase your exposure. Uh, we produce blogs for you. You've got the access to the exclusive lending. We put on quarterly events. We manage your, um, we manage your networking events if you want to put one on and we give you the benefit of our legal documents and obviously the network that we've created. So we work on the basis that we don't make money unless you guys make money. And that's how we work. So if you're interested in Source, by all means, send me an email. Here's my details. Uh, Chris.Kirkwood at source.co. The keen eye amongst you would have seen that as I logged into the CRM system, I'm sure. But I'm happy for you to have my email address if you've got any questions about this webinar, and please feel free to get in touch. We have got other webinars that are going to be coming up. So uh, I believe you've booked this on Eventbrite. Head back there, have a look for Source, have a look what other webinars that we've got coming up, and please subscribe because we're, as you can see from this one, we're giving away a huge amount of free content. Um, I'm trying to educate as many people as I can to really raise those, raise those standards throughout the industry. And that starts with giving away free content by having conversations with people. Hopefully you'll do the same thing and let's get people, you know, understanding what return on investment is as opposed to return on capital employed and stop people sending right move links as, as a sourcing deal. So it's been a pleasure to talk to you today. 
thanks very much for your time. Really appreciate it. If you've got any questions, please feel free to get in touch.